But today's sermon uh, is entitled, England's Green and Pleasant Land. Those of you who have thumbed to the end of the service sheet will know already that I've uh, chosen that great anthem of Englishness, Jerusalem, as our final hymn. And we started our service, of course, with glorious things of the our spoken Zion city of our God, a hymn to Jerusalem, uh, both as a, a physical place, but also as an idea, Jerusalem, two words that mean city of peace. Uh, when when the, the hymn we'll sing at the end of today talks about uh, in, uh, Jerusalem being built in England's green and pleasant land, it's referring to that idea of peace, a city of peace being built here in England's green and pleasant land. So it won't surprise you perhaps to realise that I want to just invite us to contemplate the theme of nationalism this morning. I am an Englishman. There have been many times in my life when I've identified with other nations too. Being an honorary canon of two cathedrals in Africa, for example, gives me a somewhat unique perspective and a sense of belonging to a wider human family. But ultimately, at my core, I am an Englishman. My heart swells with pride when I see the cross of St. George flying on the top of our tower. Yeah even if St. George never actually set foot here in England. Now, I, I did shed a little tear at the death of the Duke of Edinburgh, I will confess, a true Englishman. Yeah. And I was sad when we failed to win a certain football match recently. Yeah. I was not as sad, however, as I was at the awful racism that followed our defeat. That made me much more sad. I glory in Gilbert and Sullivan's epic song, For he is an Englishman. Yeah, do you know it? Yeah. For he himself has said it, And it's greatly to his credit That he is an Englishman. He is an Englishman. There you go. Well, very good, yeah. 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 Of course, the word English derives from the tribe of Angles, the Germanic-speaking Northmen who colonised much of the British Isles after the Romans had abandoned us to our fate while Rome itself was burning. England is really Angland, the newly acquired land of the Angles. But my great-grandparents came from Ireland and from Wales, which perhaps goes some way to explaining my love of singing. <laughs> the plain fact is, I'm actually a Celt or a Briton, not perhaps an Angle or an Englishman at all. Well, okay then, I can at least say with some certainty that I am British, can't I? Well, no actually. Uh, DNA research into all human ancestry leads to a scientific conclusion that all of us are descended from Africans and that the great rift valley of Africa is the birthplace of modern humanity. After their migration from there, humans interbred with other hominoid species like Neanderthals. On average, all human beings, all modern humans, have within us between 1% and 4% Neanderthal DNA, some of which was on display at last weekend's football match, I think. So, it turns out I am part Celt, descended from Africans, with up to 4% Neanderthal DNA. I'm sure Claire would testify that I have plenty of Neanderthal DNA. Yes, yeah. I'm living in a country which has only been called England for well, about a thousand years or so. But I'm an Englishman and an African and a Neanderthal. Oh, it's very confusing, isn't it? 
The problem we face, you see, is that most human beings have a deep desire to belong somewhere, to be identified as uh, belonging somewhere, either as the owner of a land or, as with many Aboriginal peoples, owned by the land. The Jewish people held on to the promise that a certain portion of land was theirs for almost 2,000 years since the fall of the temple in AD 70. So strong was their belief and so persuasive their argument that the modern state of Israel was created out of what had been, for centuries before, Palestine. However complicated is the truth of our messy ancestry, we also feel a strong call to bind ourselves to those around us, don't we? We tend to form tribes, partly out of a sense of shared endeavour, partly to protect ourselves against other tribes who might want to come and take our land or our stuff. Our tribalism is at the same time formed out of the need to build something with other people. But it is often defined by our opposition to other groups, other tribes of people. And that embedded tribalism, it expresses itself in different ways. For some, it produces an allegiance to a country. For others, there's perhaps a greater allegiance to a way of living, perhaps as a football fan, for example, or a member of a political party, or the fan of a popular music combo. Many of these tribes set themselves up in opposition to others. Football tribes tend to hate other football tribes, don't they? Political tribes are often entirely deaf to the wisdom that any other political tribe may, from time to time, have to offer, believing that their tribe, the tribe they belong to, is the only one, good or ill, and that their tribe has all the answers. And then, of course, there are the tribes of different philosophies and religions. Religious tribes tend to transcend national boundaries. So to call one's country a Christian country, or for that matter an Islamic country or a Buddhist country, is to lay claim to membership of a much wider, broader, deeper tribe than mere national identity or local politics alone. The best religions, of which, of course, I say Christianity is one, has the power to call nations beyond the narrow confines of national interest and into shared endeavor with people all over the world. Which is why St. Paul, writing to the Ephesians in this morning's epistle, was so keen to assure non-Jews, that is, Gentiles as they were known, That Jesus brings all nations and identities into one new kingdom. With Jesus as the cornerstone of a new living temple to God. Paul's vision is lofty and powerful. He says, and I quote, So you, and he's talking to to Gentiles, to non-Jews, to those who would have been considered outside. You, he says, are no longer strangers or aliens. You are citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him says Paul, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple to the Lord, in whom you are also built spiritually into a dwelling place for God. That's a pretty profound thought, isn't it? You and I, with all our different backgrounds and experiences, all our different races, all our different ways of being, are invited to be 
a living temple for God. Now, naturally enough, as you would expect, Jesus also understood this. He didn't only preach the kingdom of God to Jews. He spent time in places like Tyre and Sidon and Gabardeen and, as we heard in this morning's gospel, Gennesaret. These were places where Jews and Gentiles mixed much more freely together than they did in places like Jerusalem. There were even pigs being farmed in some of them, like in the land of the Gabardines. You'll, you'll remember the story of Legion and how, uh, how uh, evil spirits were cast out from him and into pigs. Well, what were pigs doing there in a Jewish land? Well, it's because it wasn't only Jews living in that land. Jesus preached to Canaanites and, and, and Philistines and Samaritans and Romans as much as he did to Jews. And he healed their sick too. Later, before he ascended into heaven, Jesus told his disciples to preach his gospel message to all nations. And one of those nations, without a doubt, was England. So when I think of England, I think of a country which at least in principle has the capacity and the potential to be part of that great Christian ideal, a truly Christian kingdom. So bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Help me to battle for a Christian England in which strangers and aliens, Jews and Gentiles, and people of all races are welcomed and cherished. Bring me my chariot of fire to race towards a Christian England in which workers in dark satanic mills are freed from the slavery of profit-driven exploitation. Oh, clouds unfold on a Christian England in which Christ's example of offering healing to everyone he met is not subcontracted out for profit. Bring me my spear to fight for a Christian England which offers charity and aid to all who need it without counting the cost in terms of percentages of national income. I dream of a green and pleasant land in which, in the words of the prophet Micah, we truly know what it means to do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Now that's an England of which I could be truly proud. Amen. Amen.